Ciao Patrick, How are you? How are you? welcome Good. to Toscana in Montalcino, we'd Good like to introduce see. you Ciao, Sebastian. benvenuto, Sebastian. Benvenuto. Patrick. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you also, Sebastian. Welcome in the middle of nowhere. Yes, yeah. uh, I love this middle of nowhere. Uh, can you uh, walk me around this nowhere? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, Let's awesome. go. Okay. Yeah. Montalcino is a very special place. It's not just a wine region, mm -hmm. but it's a community, a community of farmers. Mm -hmm. And it's very important that you, you feel this sense of community because this is our, our soul, our, the story of our wine and the story of our life. Mm -hmm. We are in the middle of nowhere, as I told you, yeah. and we are a very little village, and there are 220 wine growers, and the community is uh, really involved in winemaking every day. Montalcino is a medieval village, and has many other places in Tuscany. Mm -hmm. Had uh, his beautiful age with visitors and people from everywhere, uh, during the Middle Age. It is how we started to produce food and having a place to host visitors. And it's been a great time of our community. And yeah, a Middle Age probably is still signing our personality because yeah. as Tuscany, we are uh, a bit shy uh -huh. and uh, very proud of our region and our wine. And uh, of course, it's a clear sign in our personality. Yeah. What is this area here that we're... Hello, you are in Podere Le Ripi. That is, a, for me, a very special place. It's not just a winery. For me, it's an habitat. An yeah. habitat for wine, but also for people. We are a small team and uh, all very young, guided by Francesco Illi. It's a very little winery where we try to keep care and make our business sustainable mm -hmm. for the wine that we are making for the people that are working here and for our land. Yeah. And uh, this is why if you visit a winery in Montalcino, mm -hmm. for us, it's very important that you understand that first in a winemaker, you need to be a farmer. And yeah. this is our roots and our, uh, our main point to explain to the people. This is why if you travel in Montalcino, you don't see only vineyard like many other wine regions, but you see a hill with a big complexity of field, olive groves, wild land, grain, and everything is a part of our wine. Is that what you mean by biodiversity? Biodiversity, yeah. yeah. And I see over here you say biodynamic garden, it says yeah. on this tree. That looks like, an, how old are these olive trees? Hello, we are here in front of 200, 300 years old olive trees. Two or 300 years old. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, in Tuscany, olive oil production is uh, such an important culture mm -hmm. and uh, is the easy way to lose money <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately but uh, if you forget your olive trees for the community is a scandal they can really oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway is a this is a little corner of our place where we try to produce some food for the people that are living here mm -hmm. and also producing our biodynamic preparation and improving and keeping our habitat more alive and more vibrant with uh, different plants and not just wine, wine growing. Do you think having the habitat affects the wine? Yeah, a lot. A lot because uh, unfortunately through the years many, many food, many, many wine are coming for a very intense farming uh, process. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's for sure the easy way to control the, pr the process and having a standard to save some money during the, pro during the process, but it's not sustainable for our soil and for, for us that yes. we enjoy our food. Because yeah. for example, here we live off the land. Yeah. We, we drink our wine, or luckily even other wine <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> yeah. and we have our food yeah. during the season. And yeah, having a more biodiversity mm -hmm. is a way to keep the ecosystem more in balance mm -hmm. and not be slave of chemical stuff or chemical facilities. Can you show me around? Of course. You know, I have to share with you the garden because the tomato, the garden is probably <laughs> the, the most proud stuff of Tuscan people. No, uh, if you visit a Tuscan farmhouse. They have pride in yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. 
The wine industry is arrived in Montalcino not many years ago, mm -hmm. almost 50. For many, many years, making wine in Montalcino, like many other places in Italy, it's been uh, everyday life. Yes. It's been, uh, I don't know, something like uh, normal for, for as we did uh, tomato or olive oil or uh, any rice animal in the field, mm -hmm. we, we produce some wine. Mm -hmm. But we never imagined the wine has our main business and <laughs> our yes. main source of uh, economy. Economy, yeah, economy yeah. yeah. And this is why, if probably this late development in the wine mm -hmm. is still now influencing uh, the the shape and the view in our hill. Because yeah, because the landscape changes. Yeah, 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 it's changing, but keep the hill in a mix of field and plants because that's the only way to keep the wines close to the traditional expression. This, uh, I see you have beautiful tomatoes. Yeah, yeah. I spend more time here than in the vineyard. That's <laughs> a good <laughs> for a wine grower. Is it, does everybody have tomatoes in, uh, in Tuscany? Only Let's the serious Tuscan Patrick. guy. Yeah. Only the serious Tuscan guy. Oh yeah, so otherwise yeah. you're not a real Tuscan. Yeah, yeah. and as you see, that's, These are all organic bad dynamic. Yeah, right? yeah. Our tomato, you don't see mm. purple or blue covering from copper because uh, you don't spray you know spray and uh, we keep different plants close to each other for example right, so you have the basil right here that's a basil and basil love to stay close to the tomato not only in the dish but mm -hmm. even in the field because the smell of the tomato keep away many bugs uh, the basil the basil uh, repels Protect. bugs okay. yeah and the tomato can produce a shadow that help the, the basil to grow in a more humid place you can't, I mean, there's so much flavor in this tomato. Yeah. With now I got the fresh basil. You already mix. Mm. <laughs> anyway, it's a... Mm. Uh, Isn't it? Fantastic. Yeah. Mm. And you can see how are big. It's so beautiful, yeah. They're beautiful. Yeah. And uh, anyway, we, we try to cultivate and keep care of our land in a way that is still alive. Mm. Without destroy the, the life inside the soil, without uh, impact the local life. Mm -hmm. This is why we use lots of dry straw. Yeah. to keep the soil a bit more humid and soft and use more compost in, inside. You and dry farm here? Yeah. So there's no air. So no, the tomatoes are irrigated. But, irrigate, the vineyard, but the vineyards are all yeah. dry farmed. Yeah, the vineyard in Montalcino, the Brunello vineyard are by the rule dry farming. All of them, not just yours? Yeah, just the first. No, no, in Montalcino. In Montalcino, that's what I mean, all yeah. the, vin the yeah. uh, vineyards. That's very important because, you know, if you have a plant, wherever, tomato or vine that is growing, thanks to the water, thanks to the fertilizer, thanks to the human care, yeah. is not linked with the place, it's linked with you. Right. And uh, cannot show the personality of our soil, the, the sense of place, because it's just within us. It's becoming very lazy. Yeah. What we want is show to the people in the glass of wine this personality that is uh, just about the land. And every time that we feed the vine or wherever, the roots are coming up yeah. and they're not anymore reinforcing this connection because the real brain is underground, are the roots. And is, our priority is keep the roots deeper to reinforce the connection between the plants and the ground mm -hmm. and after having a great light. The light and the soil are the two. So you're saying if you irrigated the, the vines, then, then the roots don't need to work as hard, they don't yeah. go as deep. So this you're is, right. so it's, so it's the fruit reflects the root basically is yeah. what you're saying yeah the fruit yeah. reflect the season mm -hmm. i mean the light mm -hmm. the temperature the the sky and the soil yeah. and of course if you have pollution in the air if you have a bad light making uh, something of wrong between the glass of wine and the fruit mm -hmm. and at the same time with the soil mm -hmm. many modern um, viticulture process and in cultivation are really impacting the soil mm -hmm. and that's not sustainable. Maybe you can produce a good wine because thanks to the modern technology and the solution that we have today, you can produce a wine more or less everywhere. But to pick this unique sense of place, you need to work without be between the vine and the place, but just next to the vine. So it's, it sounds like there's a difference between saying uh, you know a good wine that can be produced versus a wine with soul yeah yeah where it's where there's more to it in the farming and yeah. the habitat and the yeah. people you yeah. know how it all comes together yeah. yeah 
Yeah. Montalcino is famous because it's never been a place for famous winemaker or bottle of Brunello signed by the winemaker, but uh, it's been is famous today to be a place where you can have great single vineyard. I mean, what we underline mm -hmm. over our label is the name of the vineyard. That's mm -hmm. our main character. Right. That's what makes our wine different. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that if you have a pure grape like Sangiovese in our wine, keep for five years, mm -hmm. the potential of the quality that I can catch is just about the field. Mm -hmm. What I have to do is just don't ruin this potential that the nature is offering me. Mm -hmm. And this is why many, many times I feel less I touch mm -hmm. and better is the wine and I have more time to do the garden. Nice, and nice. <laughs> we are going uh, closer to the vineyard. Mm -hmm. We are in a very special place because uh, this corner of Montalcino is called Castelnuovo dell'Abate. It's one of the... What does that mean? Castelnuovo is a local name, the local name of the village. Castelnuovo, okay. Yeah, it's a little village with 500 people. Mm -hmm. You know, Montalcino is a hill, it's considered a wine region, but mm -hmm. technically it's a very little area uh -huh. because uh, it's a hill with four different positions, mm -hmm. with uh, an altitude between uh, 200, 100 meters over the sea level and 600. Uh -huh. And there are vineyards everywhere around the hill. Mm -hmm. Of course, with different condition of farming, because someone is exposed to east, someone to south, north and west. Mm -hmm. And exposition, altitude and soil are the main factors to understand the difference between the different Brunello. Is, what is uh, the soil like here? Because I'm looking at it, it's, yeah. you know, is it more like uh, Allora, Montalcino mm -hmm. is, is considered uh, ocean hill because mm -hmm. uh, almost five millions of years ago was completely covered by the ocean uh -huh. and uh, this is why all around the hill especially in the middle band around Montalcino we have a layer of uh, ocean clay mm -hmm. mixed with limestone we have lots of calcare lots of limestone coming from the digestion of the fossil mm -hmm. in the ocean and this is a great terroir for our wine mm -hmm. of course just moving 100 meters in every direction, you have a different Changes, soil. Yeah. yeah, we are so close to the old volcano, Amiata Mountain. That's an old volcano? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's an old volcano. volcano. Mm -hmm. It's why we have many hot springs in the area. Okay. It's a kind of... You have hot springs around? Yeah, uh, no. No, not in our farm, yeah, but, over there, yeah, yeah. but all around is yeah. full of hot springs. And uh, these many natural factors are making the wine unique. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is why, first of all, that's our patrimonio, our yeah. treasure, no? It's, yes. uh, it's not something that we can build can't up. Create, it's given yeah. to you, yeah. Yeah, it is, it's everything related with, uh, with the place. The main ingredients for one of our most famous <laughs> Italian pastas. Can yeah. you find it? Basil, right? Basil, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Basil, uh, you know, it looks easy, but sometimes people that are coming from Metropoli, yeah. they lose their feeling and connection with the food and with, uh, I don't know, with the ground. And we are too often uh, uh, used to have food in box and plastic yes. that we forget yeah. completely the people that are in the field every day, the ground, the heart, and that's very important. Yes. Even the wine yeah. is becoming something of a bit fancy with a lots of show in the restaurant, mm -hmm. but everything starts in the morning, early, yeah. with people with muddy shoes <laughs> that are working in the field. <laughs> If it's rainy, they yeah. walk. If it's too hot, they, they still walk. walk. Yes. And they try to to produce something for us. Yes. And that's uh, it's it's the real beginning of everything. You'd be very proud to have Marco's uh, restaurant represents very well Italy. Yeah. Marco is uh, is our best friend yeah. around the world, and yeah. you know, food and wine in Italy are so close. Yes. We can't even imagine our wine without Italian food. Yes. This is why. It's always a team game because uh, we have to, to be very close to restaurant men like Marco and uh, wine producer need to find this connection with the people that are offering food, serving food, because the best way to enjoy Italian wine is always with the food. Yeah, together. And, and this is where I think these, the story is important because I think people come in and they eat a meal. Yeah. They don't understand like what could, what's really in front of them and how they can enjoy it on a deeper yeah. level, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's also very important to understand that if some wine from some region are having a, 
a particular characteristic say, about acidity mm -hmm. or full body. For example, in Montalcino, Brunello is very famous to have a, to be a wine with a good acidity, mm -hmm. very drinkable, very fresh, and very vibrant. Mm -hmm. This kind of personality is a result of evolution with the food. Yes. Because if our food is always very savory, very food, we have bor, we have uh, handmade pasta, we have lots of very tasty food, we cannot pair this food with a bigger wine that makes our eating and our dinner much heavier. Yes. But we have to pair with something that clean our mouth. Yeah. And this is why the Brunello is always been such a vibrant and fresh wine, because our food is offering the full body. We don't need to look for the full body in the wine, right. but we have in the food, we need of a wine that pair with this kind of story of taste and evolution. Well, wow. lot, lot to think about. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting thirsty. <laughs> you getting thirsty? <laughs> not for water? Uh, not for water. <laughs> we have a gate here yeah. because unfortunately, in Tuscan, we have to keep everything closed. Yeah. We are surrounded uh, by many boars, our community A lot boards. of wild boars, huh? Yeah, this is why we always suggest to the people order boar in the restaurant, uh -huh. help our war. <laughs> oh, no. okay, the we more are boar animal they friendly, eat. but uh, they don't have predator here. Anyway, yeah. it's it's a crazy story, no? Because when we travel around the moor, the, the world, we we always. Uh, hair from the people, wow, oh, you, you are in competition with French producer, probably winemaker from French are your first enemy. It's yeah. not true. Boar <laughs> are our the first boar. enemy. Because yeah, <laughs> yeah. they come eat everything? Yeah, yeah. Do they, they eat grapes? They eat grapes, especially when it's close to the ripening. Oh. And, uh, and they are a part of the community. Yeah. You have to respect them. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you have to eat them too. Honor them in the, in the dish <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with, a, with a good bottle of Brunello. But yeah. I see yeah. a lot of on menus a uh, boar ragu, you know, yeah, with yeah. the pasta. It's always it's yeah. so good. It's a masterpiece here. You make you make a boar marca in your restaurant? Yes, we have yeah. it as a special once in a while. And, uh, and the prosciutto uh, comes from that too, right? Yeah. You, you can have boar prosciutto and definitely always pair with, uh, with Brunello. Oh, the Brunello, yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah. But this land. If you want, can offer everything for your for your table, mm -hmm. from the wine to the vegetable. But it's very important to understand that life here is seasonal. Yes, we have four different seasons. We feel in the middle of the countryside, mm -hmm. but our peninsula mm -hmm. is in the middle of the sea because the Mediterranean Sea is all around us uh -huh. and not too far, just 50, 60 kilometers. Uh -huh. And uh, this kind of seasonality is mm -hmm. characterizing not just our food, but our life. Yeah. We dress in a different way, we play different sports, <laughs> we, we do different stuff during the weekend. Mm -hmm. In according, sometimes we go for looking for fungus, for mushroom in the forest, sometimes we ski, sometimes we go to the ocean, to the sea, or wow. to the sea. You have it all right here, you can do all these things. Yeah, it's uh, the Mediterranean life like in Italy, it's really, really connected with the seasons. And the seasons are a kind of rhythmic mm -hmm. that we, we enjoy and we live. Sometimes we forget yeah. the day, we forget the number of the day, but we keep our sense of time just uh, knowing that now is pruning season, now is harvest season, yeah. now is something else. So there's a rhythm of things to do. Yeah. What did this vineyard, uh, what's this called? This one uh, is a great, great idea of Francesco. Uh -huh. Technically, it's the higher density vineyard in the world. As a highest density vineyard in the world. As I yeah. say, the plants look very close together. Yeah, wow. are very close, just 40 centimeters far. We named this vineyard bonsai vineyard because the vine looks very small. Like a bonsai tree? Yeah, uh -huh. like a bonsai tree. Yeah. And uh, at the beginning, it was a, a little experiment mm -hmm. to challenge ourselves and guess and beat in something that Francesco always dreamed, having deeper roots. Mm -hmm. And today is our most important wine coming from three acres, more or less. And uh, it's a pure Sangiovese that is characterized by this vineyard with very deep roots, almost three meters. Wow. If you compare with other vineyards that we have, like the Alberello, the small bush, is a, is a, is a vineyard that where the roots here are much deeper because just between the vine there is higher competition. Well, it's interesting because uh, you know, uh, conventional wisdom very often was to spread the vines apart by a certain amount so they don't have to compete, but the competition actually gets the roots deeper. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, you know what? 
During the story of viticulture, we had uh, almost uh, 60 years ago, 50 years ago, we had the invention of uh, tractors. Mm -hmm. And when the tractors is arrived in our life, many, many farmers, they replanted their vineyard, keeping the vine a bit far ah. to use the machine. And the machine, of course, was a solution to save some handwork, mm -hmm. money, mm -hmm. and uh, having more control of the process and having even more land to farm and right. to control. But everybody know, especially in the world, in the old wine world, like Italy, like French, mm -hmm. that the best vine, they need to stay close to each other, to work with the roots, to don't be overproducing, to don't right. have too much grape, and the vine love to be touched by the human. I was say, so they're all handpicked. Yeah, yeah, this is the point. Like vine, they need to feel us, has a next to them, not over them. Uh -huh. And uh, this is why there is not solution that can replace the human work in the vineyard. So, you, so you're bonding with the, uh, with the with the plants as you're farming them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is uh, you know the people are coming coming here and say, oh ma, you are crazy. You are harvesting my hand. Ha harvest is just a little drop of our everyday work mm -hmm. and uh, all year work because during the year. We pass in front of the same vine mm -hmm. at least 25 times. Wow. Once to control the trim, once to control the leaf, once to control the grape. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of relationship. At the end, <laughs> you can, you are close to recognize your vine and name uh, each of them. Marco, you were telling me uh, there's varying uh, forms of Sangiovese grape. And uh, the one in Brunello is a little different. Uh, maybe, can you show us a cluster uh, and we can talk about it yes. in a minute? So this is still the bonsai vineyard here, right? Yeah. Marco, so tell me the two kinds of Sangiovese grape again. Yes, there are uh, different, many different clones of Sangiovese, uh, but in Montalcino, uh, the, the clone is called Sangiovese Grosso, where the, the, the berry, uh, the relationship between the skin and uh, it's a little higher. Yes. And uh, and you can see. So it's, this, a, so it's a bigger berry in it size. It is a little bit bigger in size. Yeah. So you have. Uh, um, the skin. The, the relationship yeah. is a, it's a little bit uh, um, more uh, pulp to skin ratio. How does that affect the, uh, the wine? When you see some big berry, mm -hmm. you probably can have amazing picture and photos, mm -hmm. but not a really good wine. Because <laughs> pulp is only water. Right. Water. The real contenitor of quality is the skin. Mm -hmm. I mean, color, fragrance, structure, and the seeds inside. So it comes from the skin okay. yeah. and the when, seeds. Okay. When you reduce the berry, the mm -hmm. sides of the berry, you are increasing the r proportion yep. between right. skin and water yes. in the pulp, and you are improving the concentration and the taste of the wine. This is why the best way to have this effect in the wine is having wine that are a bit suffering. Mm -hmm. I mean, suffering because the soil is difficult, is old, is ancient, and the, the vine are not fed by water or fertilizer, and they produce what they can, right. not what we need. That's right. a very important point. Ah, so yeah, so basically, you want the natural process to unfold, not try to impose your will on it. Yeah. We ask to the vine to do what they can yeah. with this soil and this sky, yeah. not what the, the budget can ask to us. That's <laughs> the difference. That's you great. See, and this plant, they look very young, but yep. they are very deep. And, uh, These go down very deep. And the yeah. deeper they go down, the more geological layers they, they are exposed to, and that where a lot of the complexity comes from. So these, right now, they're, they're kind of in the middle, I guess, of their growing phase, right? So will they get, uh, how big do you think? We are close to, to the variation of the color, mm -hmm. and uh, very soon the vine, the grape, gonna stop to grow mm -hmm. and just start the ripening. Mm -hmm. We normally harvest between uh, first two weeks of September and uh, half October. Oh. And this is another crazy stuff for Montalcino because if you come here in, o in half October, on the southeast side, wine growers are already in vacation. On the north are under stress and getting crazy <laughs> because the grape is still in the vine. And uh, we are speaking about 10 miles. Right. <laughs> just a different position. So it's the microclimates. Yeah. And okay. this, the, the real skill of Sangiovese, be a mirror of the place. Because Sangiovese yeah, himself doesn't have a very precise personality or aroma or variety aroma, but can be a great translator of the place where it's growing. And that's kind of purity and uh, personality is the secret and for me the most beautiful stuff of this wine.
So what other vineyards are down here? Yeah, the vineyards are very close to each other, mm -hmm. but we keep every vineyard separated mm -hmm. for the grape, but even for the wine, because for every piece of land mm -hmm. has a different soil uh -huh. and terroir, and we need to find the best tailor-made choice and oak and every, every choice during the process mm -hmm. to keep pure this uh, personality of each piece of land. Ah. But we are working in another single vineyard called Lupi e Sirene. It's our most important Brunello. Say that slowly. Lupi and Sirene. Okay, and that's, is, that's the... the name of this vineyard. And this is the most important one? This yeah, is, uh, with the bonsai. highest quality grapes? Yeah. With a bonsai. Yeah. are different, both the most important of our production. So I see these grapes are already bigger than the other ones, so they're, yeah. they're growing faster. Yeah. You know why? Yeah. If you see the vineyard, first of all, is growing with a different shape. This yeah. is called alberello. It's a traditional, authentic shape, way of farm and grow vine. Uh -huh. It looks like a little tree. And when the vines are so little, like this one, uh -huh. and uh, they, they show the best balance between the production uh -huh. and the leaf. Okay. They're not overproducing, but they keep the quantity under control yes. because they, they are under stress for the competition. Uh -huh. And at the same time, you don't have too much leaf or uh, too much energy in the green production, leaf and trims, that we don't, we don't care. Right. We want to produce great grape, not right. two meters square of leaf. Right. And the vine, when they're little and under stress, they offer always the best fruit. Of course, when you do a vineyard like this one, you have to know that the work is going to be hard because there is no machine that can go inside and check every vine and right. tie the trims. Uh, so, you, so people go down, check yeah. every vine, they, they make it uh, we have a, you know, the leaves so that they're just yeah. shading a little bit. This is the traditional uh, distance of plantation for working by, by the hand or by animal. Okay. This is why in the past, many, many vineyards in Europe, especially in the older wine region, oldest wine region, are planted with one meter square uh, density, where you can, you are allowed to go in, to get inside with an animal mm -hmm. and work the soil during the winter. Right. And during the season, just go inside by hand and pick the grape. Now I see some, uh, Marco, I see grapes over here <laughs> that are dried already. So they're raisins now. You know, uh, sometimes some vine gone yeah. because uh, they're getting older, they have yeah. some virus. It's normal, it's life. Yeah. What we do is, is replace the vine that uh -huh. we lose during the years uh -huh. to keep the vineyard alive. Because okay. we, don't do, we don't want to make a vineyard for only 20 years. Right. We want an eternal vineyard because the oldest vineyard are the best place to produce good grape. Yep. And when we lose a vine, we go inside in the winter, we remove the, the vine gone, and we place another vineyard. How old another is this vine? This vineyard has been planted in the, between 1999 and 2001. Okay. Yeah. Almost so uh, 17, 20 years. years yeah. And if you look, now you are on the Montalcino side. Yes. One of the things that I really love is that castle. The it's, castle, yeah. Yeah, it's a middle-aged castle, and this castle remembers me every day that we are in a very old region, mm -hmm. and this is what probably our four, five generation, uh, previous generation see at that time, no? yes. and it's still here. Yes. Probably now we don't have any more pilgrims, uh, Catholic pilgrims, like in the Middle Age, right, right. we have more wine pilgrims. Right, right. And the castle are not anymore for army, but a luxury resort. Yes. But <laughs> they are still here. You're still right. here, yeah. that's, that's great. This wind is amazing. Yeah. It's just, it's refreshing and yeah. it helps the, the, the vines. How does the, wind affect the, how does the wind affect the wine? The wind uh, is the best way to keep healthy the vineyard. Mm -hmm. We need breeze to dry the humidity in the night and reduce the, the fungus problem. Mm -hmm. This is why Montalcino being a hill surrounded by a little canyon that you can see in the down, in the down part of the hill yes. has lots of breeze every day mm -hmm. and is keeping the hill very dry. Sangiovese enjoy this dry climate and weather and can ripe up to end October, half October. This is one of the secrets of Sangiovese and Montalcino, mm -hmm. a very late and slow ripening. Nice. Even if I believe that the real show is outdoor. Yeah. Because <laughs> when you see something like this, 
It looks like a theater, I don't know. Yes. It's something that uh, there is no any human Technical. skill or uh, evolution, or I don't know, that can make an artificially way such a great show. Yeah. Beautiful. So this is a chicken coop? This one are a uh, part of our uh, community, no? Our Great. habitat. Your habitat? Firma Tabuncitina, bravo. First. You know? Uh, That's our Tuscan chicken. Tuscan chicken? Yeah. Oh, they peck? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, but they Huge. make great eggs. They Huge. make great eggs, huh? They make fantastic eggs. Those very yeah. yellow yolks. But they very made red. Yeah. Red. Yeah. They made eggs not because they have, but because they're happy. That's I'm surprised the how soft it is. Yeah, it's so it soft. They're comfortable around you, huh? Yeah. 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 Well, you want to see where are the yeah, eggs? Sure, sure. These ones are some duck. Uh -huh. That's on a mute duck. It's a local breed ah. and uh, never yeah. speaks. Strange uh, face. A faccio brutta, as they say. Faccio brutta. I think they already picked the oh, eggs. They it. So this is where you get the eggs? Wow. A commotion. What's that about? They are calling uh, someone. <laughs> this duck is very famous for ragu. White ragu is always made with this one? a mute duck. Oh, with this one? Yeah. yeah. So you raise them, you get eggs, do you also eat them or no? You know, we use these fans to give you, to the people, an opportunity to remember where the food is coming from. Now, yeah. it looks a, stu a stupid experience to go inside a chicken fence. Right. But uh, for many people, it's something they never tried before. Mm -hmm. Just touch a chicken yeah. and see wherever are coming from the, the eggs. That's it, great. It's a very simple experience, but very significant for people, no? Yes. Beautiful. So uh, maybe we'll head down to the cellar? Yeah. Okay. Let's go in the cellar. So, uh, Sebastian, you call this your office? Yeah, it's my office. This it's is the a, cellar? Yeah, yeah, it's the cellar and it's a special place. I will show you why. Please. I'm go first. Thank you. And welcome in the place where. Yeah, I love the smell in here, right? <laughs> This atmosphere, the smell, is lots of feeling inside. So this is like round, it circles around this way as yeah. compared to straight down. This is very unique. It's been built, I will show you here. Yeah. It's been built as a Roman construction. Roman construction? Yeah, only lay by hand down bricks uh -huh. without reinforced cement. And uh, it's been uh, something that we, we follow to keep the place free from magnetic field. So this is very interesting. So he put no metal in any of this to, to reinforce it. Is there any known concern about radio frequency or magnet? What's the thinking behind that? Hello, we, we imagine our wine inside this building for at least five years. Mm -hmm. Sometimes 10, 20 is a very long time. And our wine is coming from fruit that are growing in an incredible harmonious and natural environment outside. Mm -hmm. And we decide why we have to be, we, we, we are not um, so precise in, in finding a place where this harmony can be preserved mm -hmm. during the aging. And this is why we decide let's build without reinforced cement, but in an old way, only okay. bricks. And this is why for me, our wine inside are not disturbed by anything. And so the idea is you want to make sure that remove anything that can possibly disturb the yeah. process. No, the heart is producing a, a magnetic field mm -hmm. that can cross the iron inside the wall of the building. Yes. And making uh, the Faraday cage, a kind Faraday of... Faraday cage. Yeah. yeah. And this Faraday cage is something that we can't feel on our skin, but is present and makes difference in how the particle, how the different uh, molecular are moving right. and combining right. and maybe having a place without the influence is better for our wine. I don't know, but... <laughs> but just the thought of it is amazing how much consideration yeah. there is about how to keep this as pure and natural as possible, letting the, the natural earth the magnetics yeah affect everything and not alter that through what you build. Yeah. yeah, we spend energy and time and even money to 
find the better the best solution mm -hmm. to don't influence our our product yeah. not to improve our product because the quiet is here so we're walking around there's this dome here <laughs> looks strange yeah yeah it does look strange what is this yeah this is a surprise it's a uh, surprise yeah okay. i will show you later okay okay i like surprises yeah and another very important point is the shape of the building yes because this building is realized mm -hmm. to enjoy the gravity during the process. I mean, all the fresh grape is coming in from the beginning of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. We go for the fermentation in the first barrels. Mm -hmm. And after the fermentation, during the five years of process, we always try to move the wine just by the gravity. So you, you hook up and then it just gravity feeds down? Yeah, well. without pumping. So no pumping, just so I can see it. So this is the tank. Yeah. We go downstairs, mm -hmm. just connecting the barrels with a pipe. And this tells me what's in here right now. Yeah, this is Brunello di Montalcino, 2017. Bio, I mean, it's... Bio-organic. Yeah. It's bio-organic. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And as you see, we ferment and we process our wine in the oak. That's very important because, mm -hmm. you know, Sangiovese is very similar to Tuscan people. It's very shy and very sometimes looks strange and weird, but at the end is, is a wine that needs of time. Yeah. And the time has to be in contenitor with a very low and slow aging, because otherwise, when you are rushing in Tuscany with the wine, with the food, with the people, you lose your identity. We have to be very slow. This is why we love big size barrels mm -hmm. where everything is going on very slowly. And the Sangiovese find his road, his street, his way by himself. Marco, this has got to be a big challenge. You know, we're here because of you, because you know this place. Uh, you serve this wine in your restaurant uh, back in the United States. Uh, there's so much story behind the wine. It's a beautiful story. Uh, so what's the challenge for you when you're serving, trying to take this epic story and put it all into in front of somebody and have them understand it. Yeah, so great, great, great question because uh, when I am at table side or when I talk about a wine, I have few seconds to be able to choose some words to explain what we are going through today. Right. And sometimes I feel like um, I don't do an, a, a good job enough right. uh, and I try because uh, behind a bottle of wine, uh, there are many, many people and many, many days of hard work and it's very hard to, to explain, so. Yeah, because I know now, I mean, every time I open this wine now, I'm gonna see his face, I'm yeah. gonna listen to his voice, and I'm gonna Absolutely. drink the wine. Yeah. So, so for you, it's, it's, you're trying to translate that, and, and this is, you know, I think why your, your restaurant is very special, is that uh, you come here very often. You're getting the, all the stories, you're understanding things, and you bring it back you know, to, to Veneto, your restaurant, to talk about it. So now I understand how hard a job you have. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun job. Yeah, and, it's a fun and, job. Uh, but, uh, and for me, I'm easy. very proud, and it's a great pleasure to be able to, to represent and be able to talk about uh, uh, special uh, properties like Podere Le Ripi and Sebastian. But what I love of this culture of food, of wine, uh, Marco, his food, my wine, is the simplicity. Yes. Because at the end, we are speaking about very simple stuff that people are making uh, for century. Mm -hmm. And uh, our beautiful story, but simple food. Yeah. And we have to stay simple because people want to understand, people don't want to feel manipulation, but just simple taste and clear and pure. Beautiful. Well, let's walk down and see what's in here. We are moving from the fermentation area to the aging area inside the cellar. And uh, the fermentation is a so important time of the process because it's magical. The fruit is becoming wine and uh, probably for winemakers the moment is the most, most important time of the process, the whole process. It transitions from fruit to wine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's magical because you know, in the fruit, you cannot recognize maybe the limestone in the soil, the saltiness, the sandy soil, but after fermentation, the soil is coming out and day by day is becoming more clear. Uh -huh. And it's, uh, it's something that is impossible to explain because tasting just the grape, you don't feel that. But when the wine is uh, fermented, it's, it's magical. Are you tasting it as this is going on out of the barrels? Yeah, yeah. we taste. Uh, 
you know, to produce wine as we do, we have to taste because there are not recipes or I don't know standard to follow. Right. I we taste the wine. We are a team. We follow our feeling, our stomach sometimes, and we trust in our place. Yeah. Sometimes we are not sure in what we are feeling, and we decide to wait. Yeah. We don't. We never decide to put the hand in, mm. but always do a step back. That's yeah. difficult for human because we are trained and we learn in the university, in the life, that we always have the solution to control. But this control, for me, is not the best way to produce a true wine, artisanal, and where you feel not the people, but, right. but the place. And this is why... Patrick, look, this is one of my favorite containers for wine. Why is that? This is, first of all, this is a very new, I don't think I've ever, I've been in a lot of wineries. I don't know that I've seen this, so what do we have? This is a very old uh, way of uh, aging wine in cement and... Yeah. Uh, cement? Yeah. Cement. So cement we, tanks. So you had wood when we started, now we're down, coming down to cement. Yeah. Why cement? Cement uh, is an old Tuscany technology mm -hmm. and for many, many years the Sangiovese has been processed between oak and cement because the cement is great, is porous and allow the wine inside to breathe and to evolve. Oh. After many years, many, many wineries uh, moved from cement to stainless steel because stainless steel was offering many solutions, mm -hmm. more technological solution, more cleaning, more controlling the temperature, but these kind of facilities are no are not helping the wine to evolve mm. because stainless steel has been invented for beer, for milk, all food that are not changing. Beer and milk that they want to just contain, maybe not let air in, right? Just keep clean. Yeah. Wine is in my cellar for five years because it's evolving, mm -hmm. it's growing, it's changing. And this evolution can happen if my wine is in connection with, with the oxygen, mm -hmm. with the air. This is why we use cement that doesn't taste, doesn't influence the wine in terms of fragrance, but help the Sangiovese. So literally it breathes, so, that, so yeah. there's some air exchange going yeah. on inside. A micro oxygenation. Just a micro oxygenation, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And you know what? When we have vintage with a completely different taste and a, diff a completely different evolution, we can manage the evolution between oak, where everything is happening faster, mm -hmm. and cement, where we can keep slower the evolution. Mm -hmm. And maybe I have vintage, like 14, that I, de I decide to cut shorter in the oak and wait a little bit longer in the cement mm -hmm. to respect the quality and the purity of the vintage. Or vintage, like 15, extremely rich and powerful, that they need more oak than cement. So do you feel like every year you're raising a new child? Like, yeah. you know, like you have to check how they're developing. Yeah. And, yeah, that's the beauty for me because you know you, you go to a factory to buy a chair, yeah. and more or less if you come today, if you go today to the factory and the day after tomorrow, is the same chair. Right. If you go to a handcrafter, to an artisan to buy a chair made by hand, mm -hmm. you know that every piece is different, right? Because is followed and made by, the ha by hand, by the, the, the mood of the people, by the mood of the place. And that's the beauty of our work. They are not uh, standard, but everything is full of uh, try to let the product free to show themselves. Yes. Well, after visiting hundreds of, of wineries, <laughs> um, this is fascinating. I'm learning new things, so thank you for that. Uh, is there more to see? Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. You know, you are in Italy. Yes. The best food from our country, like uh, cheese, Parmesan cheese, vinegar, balsamic vinegar, the Parma, prosciutto di Parma. Prosciutto, yeah. yeah. But even Brunello or Barolo, wherever, are food that are coming from a very slow and patient refining, aging, mm -hmm. and not by, I don't know, technology or strange process. Mm -hmm. We are a country of people used to store and used to keep great raw materials in the right way. Mm -hmm. Maybe in a cellar, maybe in a cave, right. like the cheese. But what we know is how let be patient yeah. and how preserve this amazing quality that we have from a, 
a country that is in the middle of the sea mm -hmm. and has the huge and biggest biodiversity in the world. That's, I that's, didn't know that about Italy. Yeah. The most biodiversity in the yeah, world. Yeah, we have so many kind, different kind of wow. plants we're, and we're so, so many. I'm hearing, uh, we walked in here, everything just changed as yeah. far as the echo, huh? Yeah. It's a dome here. So we're, just to finish that thought, you're saying it's more biodiversity in Italy than any other country. Yeah. Our peninsula looks like a huge garden with uh, so many different plants and so many animals, different animals, but especially about the complexity of the farming, no? We, we rise everything from the artichoke to the, I don't know, the tomato everywhere. It's, it's very, very bio, in the biodiversity. So it, it's, uh, yeah, so it's like, you look at Italy almost as a big garden, you have sea on both sides of it, yeah. and that's what creates it all, how the winds yeah. and, yeah. It's great, it's seasonal amazing. food, seasonal everything. So what's this room? It's built like a big dome, yeah. as acoustics. If I, if I was going to be an opera singer, yeah. it, might, it might be a nice room for me. You know, another very important uh, concept of this building is the golden ratio. Golden ratio. The golden ratio. Yeah, this is why we call this cellar, we named this cellar, Golden Cellar. You're talking about pie? Yeah. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Francesco is passionate in the, this idea to have a place who's respecting the proportion of the golden ratio that is very common in Italy. In all the Da Vinci opera, you can figure out some proportion about the golden ratio, but especially in the nature, in the flowers, how the flowers are showing in the fruit and in, in the stars. And when we design this building, we respected this kind of proportion for the same reason. Go in direction of harmony, and be harmonious. And this is why the acoustic here is so, this is so special. It's amazing. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, and this is, I guess, they, they just have speakers here. That, the speakers, uh, yeah. Here. And the wine is aging in these big bottles. So is there an idea that energetically, because you're in a dome that has the golden ratio, that the right vibration is here for the wine to age? Harmony is energy. Harmony is energy. And uh, we love good energy and good harmony for our wine energy is coming from the place and for the people. If the people are happy, everything can work together. And this is why energy, harmony, and beauty of the place are the secret of our product. Yeah, and this is interesting because it goes to, some people try to just understand wine very mechanically, right? Yeah. Break it down, it's got this, these different flavors, these different smells, yeah. et cetera but somebody's mood or the environment they're in when they experience the wine is going to affect the taste in, in yeah. their mouth, right? Wine, wine experience, wine passion is a journey. Mm -hmm. I was this kind of person, very mechanical mm -hmm. after my study, after, but when you start to drink the right wine, when you feel something that you can't explain just with a rule or with a chemical formula, you feel something of magical that is not uh, it's not clear, yeah. but it's so you can't measure evident, it, you know? But you experience You feel in your it. body, in, yeah. your, in your mouth. And from that moment, I stopped to believe that I was the boss of the quality, and I started to feel myself a partner and a guardian of my place to respect more my place and my wine. So to be a great winemaker, you have to be more humble. For me, yes. Yeah. The most important wine in the world are coming for people that uh, are not feeling themselves genius mm -hmm. and are just feel themselves lucky mm -hmm. to have the opportunity to take care about such a great piece of land. That's beautiful. Yeah. So Marco, you understood all this stuff already before you brought us here, right? And this is the, like, the foundation, because you always said to me, you know, with your restaurant and you, you, know, you have uh, I found out more about you on this trip, incidentally. You know a lot more about wine than what I, I... I've eaten at your restaurant many times. You bring out spectacular wines from different places and you're matching them up, etc. But now as I'm sitting with you, you, learn, you know more about wine than what you tell me. <laughs> you have a deeper understanding. But you keep saying that I want to deliver an experience. That's the whole point. I, I'm going to take people I want to... Even if they're in a bad mood and they, they don't maybe even speak to me right, I want to turn their experience around. That's, that's, that's why the, the purpose in, in the experience you want to give them is to make them feel a certain way. So, so how do you take 
what's in this man's mind and, and his heart, and then bring that you know, into a, a dining experience for people that you give them. It's very hard sometimes, it takes a, a trial and error. I need to read people and understand uh, in what mood they are. And so I, sometimes I pick wine and I pick food or as far as suggestion, depending on who I have in front. Mm -hmm. But I always try to slowly bring them uh, to my core beliefs. And, and this winery is uh, one of those wineries that for me touches me deeply uh, for everything that it's done and, uh, and the uh, process uh, that these wines are made. It, and for you, uh, you're young. I mean, you're. you're I'm old inside. You're old like, inside. Uh, you have an old Tuscan spirit, guy. a traditional spirit. In Tuscany, we are we, we born old. <laughs> I, I don't know Is that how. what they say? In yeah. Tuscany, we're born old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, unfortunately. I think I saw a sign upstairs that said, uh, "We are young, but we speak like old people." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's one of the our mantra. No, man, not because it's uh, you know we 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 rise in a very close family. And uh, we are used to, to be involved in the community, in the old and historical culture, like uh, going to the vineyard to harvest or going to the frantoio to crush some olive fruit. And they're all small experience that you do because you are in Tuscany and uh, your family cannot uh, forget to make you a part of this experience. And uh, I think that is a, a, this kind of life is today making me very responsible for my land. Does the idea for you, because you're young, that this is your life now? Does this for yeah. you the rest of your life, what you yeah. want to do? Yeah. You're going to grow old here maybe, on this land, in this habitat. Yeah, maybe come to Marco Rest on the <laughs> once. Once in a while, you get out. <laughs> No, uh, I want to stay here. I, you know, the freedom to show, to show ourselves, the freedom to, to feel a part of a, a place and it's something that uh, doesn't have price. No, it's not work for me. Yeah, um, it's your life. Yeah. yeah. Well, Marco, thank you for bringing us here. Absolutely, it's yeah. a pleasure to see you. Thank it's you so pleasure. much, it was such no. a pleasure. No, no. Uh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, it's a beautiful story that you tell and a beautiful life that you live. Thank you very much. Well, Sebastian, I was absolutely uh, excited and uh, really engaged in everything that you showed out there. It got me very excited about what this wine experience would be now. So now that we've seen the vineyards, we've seen the gardens, we've seen the habitat, the sun, the wind, how it all comes together, yeah. let's get to the actual experience at the end of that. <laughs> Marco, how's yes. your work? I'm very excited about opening and tasting this bottle with you. So what's the name of this bottle, Marco? Uh, this is the Lupia Sirene. It's uh -huh. the vineyard that we just walked a minute ago. Uh -huh. And it's uh, the... What does Lupe Sirene mean? Lupia Sirene means uh, wolf and the mermaids. Wolf and the mermaids. There's yes. got to be a story there. There is a very funny, very personal story about uh, this wine. And in fact, the wolves and the mermaids are represented in, in, on the label. Yes. And it's a long story that we'll probably have uh, to ask uh, Sebastian or uh, Francesco so we can get uh, the origin of why. You know, in Tuscany, it's no, maybe it's not so difficult making a, a great wine, but uh, making a great label is a, is a bit challenging. Uh -huh. And when we came out with this wine uh, almost uh, in 2003, uh, Francesco had uh, a very hard work because uh, Francesco is, is always been recognized as the uh, as an artist. That's it. Yeah, and uh, this label is coming from uh, his crazy idea. Represent uh, man and girl together, like a mermaid and wolf. Uh -huh. Wolf is a local animal, uh -huh. and mermaid is a uh, mythical like yeah, woman. Yeah, it's yeah. mythical. It's representing the girls that are always very fascinate, fascinating the man, yeah. but uh, a certain time they disappear under the water. <laughs> and, yeah, it's a very personal story. And does the wine have that character, a mythical character to it? This wine is very particular because uh, for me, uh, it's a wine where you can clearly understand and recognize the place where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. And and represent uh, the purity 
of our land and our tradition. This is why I, I always, uh, I'm always happy when I open this. So we went to this vineyard. Yeah. And, and you said this is like one of the important vineyards on the property, yes? Yeah, see in this wine, it's almost for me a three-dimensional experience. You have fragrant flavor on the nose. Yeah. You're getting um, the, the wild fruit. You're getting a little bit of the, the dirt. Uh -huh. There is a little coolness also you can smell and you can taste in, a, in your nose mm -hmm. about the wind that we just experienced. It's a particular vintage mm -hmm. because what we, we love is make the location very clear in the, in the glass and the vintage. The vint every vintage is a different personality and this is very important for uh, the expectation of the people because you know if you make wine following your recipe to your standard without let the vineyard free to show themselves during the, the vintage, uh, the wine became not anymore so interesting from my point of view. What I want to feel is the difference between the different vintage and mm. it's after you can prefer maybe a build a more powerful and rich vintage or a slimmer vintage from a cold season mm -hmm. but both are unique and pure in their their soul. Marco when you explained the you know the nose on it it was all those things were there as you're describing them. I don't know that I would have been able to, I, I would have said, wow, there's a lot of interesting things going on, but as you were saying it, it was like checking boxes saying, yep. Yes, and as you taste it, um, and um, the experience that I get is, is a, it is a very polite man. It's powerful, but elegant at the same time. Oh my God, it's gorgeous. Uh, and all the components in there, there is a little bit of the acidity and the tannicity, mm -hmm. and there is a, the minerality, mm -hmm. uh, there is a tobacco, there's a little bit of leather. Uh, at the end of it too, when it wraps up in my mouth, I have two clear experiences. One is that is Sangiovese and one that comes from Montalcino. And the beautiful thing of this is it can only come from here. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah 2014 is a particular vintage. It was difficult for many, many wine growers mm. because it was a bit rain mm. and a bit cold with no many shining days during the ripening. but in a vintage more challenging, like 2014, you can clearly understand the best location of the hill because when you have a season that is not perfect, only a very good vineyard can offer you a great experience in the glass. No chemical or manipulation can fix the gap. Right. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, we'll talk about this later, but there's a lot of uh, chemical manipulation by winemakers now as compared to just, the, you can taste the purity here. Um, it's it's just magical. I mean, oh, what an experience to put this in your mouth. This one is one of those wines that I say makes me smile inside yeah. because it feels natural, it makes me feel good, and I have this feeling that it is warm, gentle, and it's just complete. You, well, you told the story about the, my partner and our producer, Jeff Hayes, that the first time, it was this exact wine, right? This it was label. this exact wine. And the first time he tasted it, he, like you, you, you know, he said, you picked the wine and, and you, pour, you brought this to him in your restaurant. And he tasted it, what did he say to you? I tasted it and he had this big bright eyes looking at me like, what is this? And, uh, and, uh, and uh, that was uh, his first uh, introduction uh, to, to this wine and, and now, I, but didn't he say, this is what I want to drink for the rest of what, my life? He said, uh, this is what I want to drink for the rest of my life. I was life. talking about that. He said, uh, you know, you go, this is what I want to drink for the rest of my life. And I remember, you know, because coming here, I didn't realize that those two stories were, con or that story was connected to this place. Yes. So This is a meeting point. Yeah. This winery, this habitat is a meeting point for people from everywhere that, for many reasons, arrive here and they fall in love. And this is why we feel our, our place not just for ourselves, but for all the people that... Are sharing. Yeah, wine is sharing in Italy. And uh, having, during my little story in the wine, because I meet people like Marco or many other friends around the world, and they, we immediately find a good connection. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, here we can can be not be under stress for making quality because the quality is here. Yeah. And just to be careful 
but, but just we have to share this passion and th what we are, who we are with the, with the people. That's beautiful. And can people uh, book appointments to come and taste here? Yeah, okay. we have uh, people from everywhere and uh, we love to tell them the story of Montalcino first and our story because at the end we are grateful to our community and our story and it's thanks to the people, the first generation mm. that now we have uh, such a great opportunity to have a wine that is impossible to repeat around the world, is authentic with a beautiful story. Marco and Sebastian, my ancestors came from Italy. And uh, one thing that we're very uncomfortable doing is eating or, or drinking in front of other people. You know, with, if I'm having something, I want them to have something too. So I'm hoping as we do this that the, that the viewer will also maybe go pick a bottle of wine that they really love, open it up, and let's, uh, let's all have this experience together. Absolutely. That's, uh, we have another way of saying in Italy that Depending on who's coming for dinner, you judge uh, the guest by the quality of the wine they open. <laughs> you can tell uh, how so much you like. They like you. <laughs> they like oh, they you. They don't nice like wine. you. So. <laughs> well, then I, I feel very privileged. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Salute. 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 One of the takeaways I hope you got from this interview is that when people are making world-class wines, what it takes to get into that bottle to your glass, that there's an entire lineage, philosophy, sweat and toil and passion and love that stems back years ago, that all that translates into what gets poured into a glass and consumed into your body. And that never came alive for me before like it did when Sebastian gave us his tour and explained his philosophy. If you got even a hint of that, your life is better and your wine experience in your future is gonna be seriously upgraded. What's a Brunello? Uh, Brunello is a, is a wine, it's a red wine made with 100% Sangiovese from a very small area in the south part of Tuscany in the commune of Montalcino, mm -hmm. that it's about an hour south of Siena. Mm -hmm. And Brunello is a typical name of this wine, it, they can only be made in that area. And there's rules around it to be able to call it Brunello? There are rules, one of it is has to be 100% Sangiovese, another one has to come inside of vineyards from the boundaries of the commune of Montalcino, another one is that it has to be aged at least five years, uh, so there are different, different rules on, on the aging, uh, the making, and uh, the grape varietal. And what are the characteristics? Is it a medium-bodied wine? Is it a full-bodied wine? Uh, it is a, um, because also starting from a five years of age is usually a higher structure, it is a more important wine, it's a stronger wine. Mm -hmm. um, you can have styles with a little bit more fruit and mm -hmm. some others a little bit drier, but generically speaking it's an important wine. We mm -hmm. say in Italy that once you're drinking uh, Brunello, you're drinking well. Yeah, yeah. It, is, uh, it is one of the, the, the very important uh, wines out of Italy, one of the kings of Italy. So we say important, meaning um, high status? High status, high price. Mm -hmm. uh, Brunello comes uh, uh, with um, usually a, a price point that it's a little higher mm -hmm. um, because uh, it takes so long to, to get it ready and to be approved, to be stamped as Brunello that um, it's not for uh, your everyday wines. When do you like to serve a Brunello? I like uh, to attach Brunello to something special uh, mm -hmm. when I drink it. So I like to attach it to a special occasion, a special moment, mm -hmm. a special dish, uh, uh, a celebration. Uh, Brunello should be about celebrating something with, with someone else. Mm -hmm. So I attach Brunello with uh, uh, good, good food, good dinners, but mostly like good moments to be shared with, uh, with someone. Now I have the great pleasure to introduce you to Ugo Fabri. Ugo is the general manager of the winery Prima Pietra, and this winery is owned by Massimo Ferragamo, and you probably have heard the name Ferragamo. Salvatore Ferragamo, the famous designer, so this is his son, who has a passion for wine that translates into the work that Ugo does. And Ugo gets the Charismatic Award. This guy walks into a room and he just lights it up quintessential Italian, 
talks with his hands, all the gestures, the passion he has. We spent a good amount of time with Ugo, and I have to tell you, I, my cheeks hurt because I was laughing so much, I was smiling so much, and I was having a great time. So let's get into this interview with Ugo and let your cheeks hurt too. Hugo, thank you for inviting us up here to this estate. It's very beautiful. This is the first time we get to sit and have the sea behind us, and, and this is a part of the story of this whole estate. So uh, we got to have a beautiful also dinner last night, and I got to learn a lot of things about you and what you do. It seems like you're having a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Let's, let's go back. How did you get in the wine business? Uh, yeah, I actually from another world. Mm -hmm. I was a graphic designer. Mm -hmm before this job, and I studied that. So I actually had the, uh, the work of the dreams of people that study what I studied. Mm -hmm. So, but there was something in me about wine that I wanted to, to learn more, mm -hmm. and I did the sommelier course. Mm -hmm. So just by chance, just to know more about wine. You know, when you, when you see the shelf with, uh, with a thousand bottles, you don't know what to pick because mm -hmm. you, you're not knowledge enough to, to select what you want. Mm -hmm. Then I wanted to, to study and to, to go there and say, I want this mm -hmm. because wine is something that I wanted to, to improve and to know better. So I did the course and I became sommelier while I was doing the, the graphic job. Were you working in a restaurant or? No, no, no. Yeah. Just, I you mean, just got the credential. Yeah, okay. exactly. I, I was continuing doing my job there. But one day, a friend of mine that uh, was working for Castillo de Bosco at the, at the hotel told me that at the winery there was a available position mm -hmm. in, the, in the winery. So I, I, don't know, I don't know how, I don't know why mm -hmm. I changed my life one day from another. And I... I start this this journey in the wine world. I would never go back yeah. because it's much more fun. It's it's a passion. So I get up in the morning. It doesn't seem that I that I work every day. I mean, it's so beautiful, and I yeah, I love it. So uh, you also travel around the world because of this job now, right? To yeah. go and, and uh, let people know about your wines and, and uh, exactly. what you're doing. Um, so this question, it's interesting because it's kind of a personal question, but when you made the move to, uh, to take the job in the wine industry, did, were you making about the same amount of money, more or less? Uh, at that time, I used to have uh, my own, another business mm -hmm. that was my own company. So actually, the same money. I would okay. say the same money. And yeah. then year after year, I, I decided to, I mean, I understood that wine was my life and my, my world. So right. I decided to close my own company and now I am all in. I did the all in in the wine industry. Put all yeah. the chips in. Yeah. I mean, I, nice. I, feel, uh, I feel this as my world. I mean, it's very social. I meet people all the time. I, I drink wine and that, that's what I love. It is what I like. So, And being inside the wine business, you have the chance to drink more then when you are just a wine lover, yeah, you can travel, but mm. I mean, I talk with people that love wine every day. Mm. I talk about wine every day, so I have much more chance to, to try wine. So it's, it's a dream that, that is now a reality, but I don't know how it happened. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, did, I didn't look for it. Yeah. it. It just happened. So now you have this situation where you know a lot about wine. You studied in the sommelier course. You work, you know, with people and other wine experts. But your customer are people maybe don't know a lot about wines. You said in the beginning, oh, you walk in, there's a thousand bottles. How do I know what to choose? It's a big problem. It's a big challenge. And it makes many people intimidated by wine because they feel like they don't know uh, what, to, you know what to look for. They're maybe a little bit shy or embarrassed. And I think that's one of the, for, for making this movie, 
that's one of the things we're trying to solve. How can we demystify wine and make it easier pe for people to understand, to know how to go into a wine store, or read a, a, a wine menu, go down, pick some things. So do you, when you go out to do this, do you have solutions or do you have ways that you've been able to try to understand your customer and explain wine to them? I mean, uh, that's, that, that's my job, actually. I have to understand who, who is in front of me and how much he knows about wine and I have to try to, I mean, if, I also have expert people mm -hmm. that knows more than me. Mm -hmm. So I had to relate with them and I have to find uh, the right way to, to talk with them. Or I have people that don't know anything. I mean, they ask if the, I mean, the grapes are green or red mm -hmm. or why they don't even know even the process. Right. But I mean, wine is very simple. When I, um, when I explain wine, I try to use simple words mm -hmm. all the time. I mean, with experts and with, with new people in, the, in wine, because wine is something very, very natural. It's something that, that, that you drink and goes through your body and gives you emotions. I mean, you, the wine has a soul. Mm -hmm. Behind the glass, there is a long story about nature, mm -hmm. because vines synthesize the, the land, the terroir, the atmosphere, the whole environment mm -hmm. around them. So it's about the exposition, it's about the soil, it's about the, the sun, the rain, the wind that you get, the altitude. And then after this, there is the, the work of people lots of people, mm -hmm. from the harvest, even before, for the pruning, mm -hmm. then the harvest, then the fermentation, and then the long aging. Mm -hmm. I mean, the wine stays in our cellar for years. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when you have your glass there, it's not just a glass of wine. I mean, it's a, it's a long story, but it's, it's so magic because th there are many things involved. So it's, it's very complex, but you have to, I mean, when you drink it, then it's all, I mean, goes through your body and then you feel all that, the story. I don't know, it's not easy to explain. No, I, I'm trying to. You're doing a great job explaining. And the whole point is so often people who aren't wine drinkers, when they see how much uh, my wife and I will invest in buying wine and experience, they're like, are you crazy? You spend that much money on a bottle of wine? And, and it's like, you don't understand. But you said something that's very interesting in the way that you put it. It's, of course, the story and everything it took to get that wine to the glass that's in front of you, and that it has a soul because it has a story. But you said something that I want you to talk more about. You said, but when you put it inside of you, it creates emotions. Exactly. So talk about what you mean by that. And then I have a second question is that you drink so much wine so often because it's, you're in that business do you start to get numb to it where you don't enjoy it as much anymore? The emotion is the, is the point. I mean, you, you, you have, I had the chance. I've been lucky to, lucky enough to, to drink the wines that, that make you cry. I mean, like you, you have the, you drink, I mean, you know the story of the wine, of course, and you drink it and you feel it. It's, Take this, you, you literally had wine in a glass, you start to drink it, and it gives you so much emotion that you start to cry? Yeah. It, Tell me a story about when that happened. Uh, we were in Verona for mm -hmm. the Vin Italy, mm -hmm. and we were in, um, in, in, a, in a wine shop having dinner with, uh, with Mr. Ferragamo, uh, with, with the team mm -hmm. of us. And uh, it was, I mean, it's very, it's very kind and very generous. Mm -hmm. and, he opened that bottle, I mean, the bottle of the dreams, and I mean, wine is also, I mean, all the story behind, yeah, you know, the glass, but yeah. also behind the label, right, and right. There, is, there is a lot behind that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, literally, we, we opened the bottle, it was, a, it was a French wine that, I mean, I could never imagine to, to have the chance to drink it because it's very expensive. Right. But yeah, he, he decided to, 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 give, to give us this chance because also, I mean, to learn about wine, you have to drink it. That's the yeah. only thing that you can do, drink and drink, because you can study about it, you can, you can read many books, but at the end, 
you have to travel if you if you can, but then you have to open bottles and drink it. I mean, you have to smell it, you have to drink it yeah. and feel what the wines give it to you. I mean, and then you, you, you make your, your path. Yes. You're more in uh, French wine, you're more in Italian wine, or about variety, yes. or about the style of wine. You prefer light wine or full body wine, then you make your, your choice because nobody can tell you. That's why I don't, I don't like to follow critics or ratings because you have to follow your, your taste. That's the only, you have to train your senses to make your own ranking. That's it, the point. In the case of this French wine that you drank, you drank it, and what did you feel inside that, that you know, was it such beauty? Was it such, uh, yeah, what it was, was reverence? It was an old vintage, yeah. and actually was so, such a pure wine, like uh, extremely young, because it was still very, very high acidity, very intense. The smell was unbelievable, and changing in the glass, because mm -hmm. an old vintage, you cannot just, have a glass and smell it and and drink it. You have to talk about it and see how it evolves in the glass. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a it's a journey. I mean, mm -hmm. when you open a bottle, it's not just drink it. It's also to see how it evolves in the glass, and then that's why we use the decanter. Mm -hmm. And I mean. Then when you open the bottle, the story begins. Yeah. It's not the end. Uh -huh. It's just the beginning uh -huh. of, of, the, of the consumer point. I mean, yes. and also you, you, you I, it's interesting because you can taste the same bottle year after year and it changes yes. because it evolves in the bottle. And so the, 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 the point is you have to buy a, f a few cases, yeah. put it in your cellar. Yeah and drink it. The wine, of course, that you love, that you know that it's your wine, and then you taste year after year to see how it evolves. And when you when you see that, okay, now it's the pick. For me, it's the best, then drink it all. <laughs> <laughs> That's my suggestion. So now um, you do all this wine tasting constantly. Um, has that- Blind. And you do blind tasting? Of course. Of, co of course, what do you it's mean of course? Uh, I mean, it's the only way to do you, it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm very convinced about it. If you if you do a tasting of three, four, five wines in a in a dinner, mm -hmm. I my suggestion is to cover the label, uh -huh. taste the wine, make your I mean decision about it, your mm -hmm. judgment. Mm -hmm. You you I like it. I don't like it. Mm -hmm. I like this because I have this and this. And then you see the label. Otherwise, yeah. you're, um, I mean, big brands yeah. can influence you. Also, the price of the bottle can influence you. And then, no. Yeah, you're right. No, it doesn't work. You have to, you have to again, you have to follow your, your taste, your senses. And the best way is to do the blind taste. That's my way to to learn also. Yes. Because also you you try to think about it. I mean, you don't even know the variety, you don't know the vintage. Right. So you start to think about it. You okay, for me it's this variety and that variety. I I learned a lot doing this. Seems um, nothing but makes the difference. So now that you taste so much wine are you actually enjoying it more because you're getting more and more knowledge or it, it becomes so often every day that it's starting to get a little bit more boring? That's a nice question. Actually, I'm getting more um, sophisticated, I have yeah. to say. I don't want to be like a snob. <laughs> I mean, like, but uh, now I drink less, mm -hmm. but I drink better. Yeah. When I go back to my, like, old friends that we used to, you know, at the, at the school where we used to drink, everything was available, mm -hmm. we, you know, no money, and you want to party with your friends, you drink almost everything you find. <laughs> but now when, when I go back and they, uh, they do other jobs, they're not focused in wine, so they drink with, with no all the, the thoughts that I, mm -hmm. that I make all the time, of course. And I, I, you know, we go for dinner and they say, no, I don't drink this. They say, oh, 
yeah, you now drink only expensive bottles. <laughs> you're, you're, and it seems that I'm snob. Yeah. I mean, that I want to be more sophisticated, more lo lo knowledgeable, but it's not, it's not like this. It's just because now I can recognize the quality right. and again, having drinking lots of wine, it goes through my body and I, I literally filter it. Yeah. So, and I prefer to drink good wines because it's also about my, my, my healthy. And, and every, everybody should, should think about it because wine is, is not, of course, with Just a moderate for, quantity. I mean, you don't have to, to drink. Is it better for organic grapes then? And uh, do you look for wines that are farmed with more pure practices? Absolutely. I mean, I, I prefer to drink wines that are produced in a certain way, like a small wineries made more. Because, I mean, it's, it's not a secret. I mean, if you make million bottles or if you make some few thousand, it's different process, yeah. of course. Yeah. And the, the, the way that you train the, the vines uh, and it's, it's all different. I mean, it's a long story, but I, I mean, it's very simple to understand. If you, if you have a thousand actors, you have to train that, that actors in some way, more mechanically and more uh, in different way, of course. Do you think that as a general rule, um, the more money you spend on the wine, the better the wine is? Or is that like when you go to blind tasting, you start to realize, wow, uh, you know, price doesn't really indicate quality at all. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, my, my goal now is to drink good wines with cheap price. Yeah. I mean, my, because I can't afford every day for expensive bottles. Right. And, uh, but you can drink, of course, not big brands. Mm -hmm. You can find and discover uh, being in the wine business. It's easy because you talk with lots of people. You get many suggestions mm -hmm. from people that you, you know that they have your same taste. Mm -hmm. And um, so you can discover a tiny little production, very like organic, mm -hmm. very well made. And they are, they are not renowned and probably in, uh, in areas not very popular. So you can find a bottle yeah. for 25, 30 euro. Of course, there is a there is a minimum range. Yeah, I yeah. mean, below the that price is impossible to have a to have a good wine because I know that there are costs about it. Yeah. I mean, the, the bottle, the cork, and the label, and I mean, in the price, you, there is everything. So, but the the goal is to is to drink good wines for a, for a reasonable. Price and the the the, it, the relation is not about more you spend, better you drink. No, unfortunately, it happens often in the blind tasting yeah. that the most expensive wine are usually the the less appreciated. Well, and what's interesting, and I agree with this point. When I have this conversation with my wine drinking friends, I'd say, you know, anybody can spend a bunch of money you know, to say, oh, I've got this bottle of, you know, very famous wines and they spend a bunch of money and, and look at how good a wine drinker I am. I think that the, the goal, it's almost like the game is saying, how do I find wines that are of that quality but spend a lot less money? Because they're out there, but you have to understand how to go find them and how to, you know, how to taste and, and to zero in on them. Uh, so I, I think that that's a, you know, a part of what learning about wine is about, is how to find good value in the, in the wines that, that, you're, uh, that you're drinking. Uh, so let's talk about uh, Prima Pietra. Uh, talk about smaller, you know, uh, amounts of wine. Uh, sure. Uh, there's unique aspects. So talk about uh, this winery, you know, the property, um, the style of wines that you make. So Prima Pietra is a, is a dream. Mm -hmm. It's the dream that Mr. Ferragamo had in his mind for years. This is a Ferragamo, of the, the brand uh, Ferragamo, the famous brand, okay. Yeah, the fashion. Mm -hmm. And um, so when he, when he decided to, to invest in the wine business, he was thinking about, to, I mean, the idea was to produce the new best super Tuscan wine from the Tuscan coast. Mm -hmm. So um, he had this dream, and at the beginning he went to the next buy area, Bulgari, Mm -hmm. Because inspired by you know the renowned brands like Sassicaia, Ornellaia, 
And a school friend of him, that is a famous winemaker, uh, told him, Massimo, listen, Sassicaia is the most famous and refined wine from Bulgaria because it's the highest. Mm -hmm. So the altitude really makes the difference because you can produce more elegant wines with good acidity. So you need that altitude, at least if you want to make the same wine. Mm -hmm. In Bulgaria, there were no, no properties available. And so he decided to, to, to leave the, 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 the brand of the area because the idea was to produce the best wine, mm -hmm. not the best wine from Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. And actually he found this, this pot here, mm -hmm. Tenuta Prima Pietra, that is actually two times the altitude. What does uh, Prima Pietra mean? Cornerstone. Cornerstone. Yeah. So the first investment, the first love mm -hmm. in the wine business. And um, so he found this, it's tiny, small property, it's 11 hectares. And the idea was to produce the wine that could represent himself and his idea of wine. Mm -hmm. So no vines were here mm -hmm. when he purchased in 2002. And he planted the varieties to produce his idea of wine, mm -hmm. so his blend, mm -hmm. that is Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and Petit Verdot, mm -hmm. planted to make the blend Prima Pietra. Mm -hmm. So no white wine, no rosé, no entry level, and crew and reserve. The idea was to have one estate, one bottle. Mm -hmm. Because um, the market rules, of course, you are in the coast, so you need the white wine, rosé is fancy, but this was not the purpose of the investment. It's a, it's a dream that comes from the heart and the soul of him and focus in making his idea of wine. Mm -hmm. And so we planted the, the vines and of course, first they, they checked the, the quality of the, of the soil that we have here. Mm -hmm. It's a great exposition. We have an old volcano here. So we have a, a very good soil, very rich in minerals, mm -hmm. very irony. We have red rocks called gabbro mm -hmm. that makes the, uh, the soil very mineral. And of course, as I said before, vines synthesize all the environment. Mm -hmm. So it makes the difference at the end. Mm -hmm. Having this kind of soil, then you have a different taste at the end. Right. And since the beginning, the wine was, was Amazing, like uh, we are very happy about our first vintage 2007 and then year after year the wine is every year better. Mm -hmm. And um, in 2015 having older vines so, and we were more, mm, I mean knowledgeable about our land, our vines because it, it it's a relation also between yeah. us and them, with, with the environment, mm -hmm. we know how to train it, how to work here. And then um, one day the winemaker Cecilia decided to make an experiment mm -hmm. because having four different varieties, we have different time of harvest yes. because they, the maturation time is different. And so we ferment all the varieties separate and we age it separate. So we have the chance to taste it pure, mm -hmm. like pure Merlot, pure Cabernet in the, in the barriques. Mm -hmm. And so in 2000, with the 2015 vintage, she was like, I like these Cabernets are amazing. I should do something. So she did some experiment. At the end, she made this blend that is 85% Cabernet Sauvignon and 50% Cabernet Franc. Mm -hmm. She put in a bottle, she made the, the, the blend, and she gave the bottle to, to Mr. Ferragamo mm -hmm. to, to try it. Mm -hmm. So she grabbed the bottle, she brought it to Florence, and uh, he, had, uh, he had dinner home with his wife, and he tried the wine. Wow, what is this? I mean, is it our wine? It, I mean, the bottle was naked with just a sticker, right. sample for Massimo, mm -hmm. per Massimo. Mm -hmm. So he called the winemaker 
what is this? I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's our wine. What is this? Yes, Massimo, I did an, an experiment. It's, a, it's a, our Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon from Tenuta Prima Pietra. He said, okay, I, I want to I wanna make some bottles. I want this wine. I mean, this mm -hmm. actually, that night, that dream uh -huh. to make the new best Super Tuscan was realized. Uh -huh. it, it literally, uh, yes, I mean, it was clear that that wine was his, his wine, yeah. finally. And he said, I, I, I don't care. I mean, because it's a part of Prima Pietra. So mm -hmm. if you take all the Cabernet from the Prima Pietra, you're going to change the wine. Sure. So no, we, he decided to make it by a very small quantity. It's just about 2,000 bottles. And the name actually, we, we, we thought about it for, for a few months, what is going to be the name. Actually, the name was in the first bottle. Per Massimo, so for Massimo. <laughs> right. So in that sticker, in that naked bottle, like sample for Massimo, then at the end became the, the, the name. And that's the story of our, of our crew that is above Prima Pietra, that is our wine, of course. We produce 40,000 bottles of, of our Prima Pietra. And then we have this small selection, small production of Per Massimo, that is now our, our top wine, that we are very proud of it. And I mean, it's new, just released last year in September, but already sold out. It's, it's, I mean, the success of the wine, it's even, I mean, we couldn't even imagine because we, we let some friends try it at the beginning, then, you know, some, some customers, some, and yeah, it's, uh, because wine, it's, it's like this, people, try it, they drink it, and then it happens. I mean, it's, it's magic. They, they recognize the quality, they recognize that it's, it's different, something magic, and then the story. So it's the story of our crew. So it, it's kind of interesting that, uh, you know, so you're sitting up here on, you know, up high on the hill, and you're looking down on Sasakaya, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you have the small production house that makes very high quality wines, and uh, and and that was kind of the target, saying we want to make a you know a wine that's in that category and actually make it even better. This is actually the highest vineyard in the old Tuscan coast. Really, 460 meters above the sea level. Wow. So what kind of uh, help does that give? So obviously you said you have the volcano nearby. You're getting constant breeze here. That's, Always. That's got to affect the grapes. Breeze is the, I mean, it's the natural preservative of vines. Mm -hmm. It's very important to have it because it helps us to be organic also mm -hmm. because we, we don't have to, to spray chemical stuff to the vines because it's the health of the, of the vineyard. Mm. Keep it dry, cooler temperature. So this is, I mean, we really believe that here we are in the area that in the future will be the, the top of the coast. Yeah. That's why we produce the Tresoro wine. So talk about Tresoro. So it's a, in, in Italy, we usually uh, promote our own brand. We don't, we're not good to make a team usually. Yeah. But this time it happened. I'm very, <laughs> I'm very proud of it too, because um, we decided to, to, to let the people know Riparbella, mm -hmm. that is the... That's this area? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. this area. That we really believe is, is very vocated because this breeze is constant every day and that's why we are all organic here. Mm -hmm. All the producers, our neighbors, Duemani and Cagliarossa. And we decided to produce one wine with all our wines like uh, every winery put a variety mm -hmm. in this in this wine one third each and um, we want to we, we decided to, to make this wine to represent an, an area to mm -hmm. talk about it so now this wine is gonna be uh, it's gonna be sell to, to people that, that love our wines that have listed all our wines plus Tresoro that is a uh, Tree and Tesoro, so tree and treasure is a, is a blend of words. And we are very happy because the wine is fabulous and is a good, is a good 
choice to to talk about this spectacular area that we really believe is going to be the, the future mm -hmm. because the climate is changing it's getting hotter and hotter and here we don't suffer any we don't we don't have any stress because consider that every every hundred meters you lose about two degrees celsius of course and uh, so we we can wait the right ripening of the of the grapes because here is never too hot of course in the lower part the the um, grapes suffer the, the the heat of the summer mm -hmm. that can reach you know the, the 40 celsius degrees so it's it's very hot and the grapes get cooked from from the sun mm -hmm. and uh, so here we don't get any of these problems and that's why we think that we are sit in a very special area. This winery made its first vintage 2007. So you're still a young winery. Yeah. Um, what do you, what's the future? Where do you want to see it go from here? I want to I wanna stay like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, we decided when we, when we built the, the, the winery, we could make an, uh, an, a big new winery inside the hill with you know, a capacity of 1,000 and 1,000 bottles. No, when we had when we had to decide where to put the winery and how to make it, we decided to restore the old villa that actually can fit all the production mm -hmm. and not one bottle more. Mm -hmm. So I don't wanna I don't wanna expand, I don't wanna make more bottles. Mm -hmm. The goal for me is to grow in quality and of course going growing in price to maintain the, the vision. Mm -hmm. Because when you grow in, in production, then of course, even if you don't want it, you're gonna lose something in quality yeah. because yeah. the two things can go together. Right. So the, the, the idea is to keep it like this. We now know exactly every each plant, every parcel of the, of the vineyard and we can just grow in uh, in quality that that's what we i mean that's what i think and the property that's true the owner thinks so I'm, I'm i mean i'm lucky to work for people that think like this mm -hmm. because is the is the only way to to maintain and the standard of the quality and i really believe that is the only way to to work terrific Ugo, thank you very much for uh, you know, sharing all this information and all this knowledge and experience with us and for inviting us up to uh, Prima Pietra to experience it all. Thank you very much for coming. Grazie. Grazie. So admit it, I think you want to hang out with Ugo now too, don't you? Really fun, really passionate, phenomenal wines, great experience all around. Well, with regard to tasting and the way you're describing it, you know, some people say, oh, this is a sweet wine. People say this is a dry wine. What are the differences there? Uh, usually sweet wine is referred to a wine that has a lot of residual sugar. So in the fermentation process, mm -hmm. uh, the fermentation did not happen all the way through. And so a lot of the, the sugar is still in the grape. And so it gives you an immediate gratification as far as palate sensation. Mm -hmm. uh, sweetness is one of them. And, and sometimes uh, it can be referred to like candy-like or mm -hmm. uh, ripe fruit. And that is all a consequence of the sugar that it's in the wine. Mm -hmm. And dry wine is the opposite, basically. It, it, there's a lot more alcohol or, or less sugar or no sugar. Exactly, and so a drier wine is usually maybe a wine that has uh, very little sugar residual in the wine, and so you're, you're feeling more uh, the, the acidity, you're feeling more that your mouth dried out uh, after you swallow. Where does the term fruity come into this? Though this is a fruity wine, is that is that sweet, dry, or is that something else? Uh, fruity is um, a mix between a sweet wine and uh, a younger wine, a fruit forward wine, where the fruit is your main component and it stands out over anything else that you're drinking.
Well, that concludes episode two. We're still in the beginning stages of the entire Wine Revealed experience, so share this with people. They can jump in right now, they can pick up on episode two, and then take the rest of the ride with us. I certainly enjoy being here with you and appreciate the fact that you're spending your time to look at the work that we've done on this project. I think it's something that will enrich your life. So again, thanks for watching and I look forward to seeing you in episode three. It's like a gas station, like a it's, petrol station. It seems, yes. <laughs> I've never seen this before, Marco. Do yeah, you know about yeah, this? Oh, yeah. 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 This is, uh... You want to try? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. And then uh, the prices are all shown like at a gas pump? About the liter, yeah. yes. And then you just take it out? Yeah. Yes. And you put here. Yeah. The family Simjic start making wine in 1860. So I work uh, professional with my father 28 years mm -hmm. and make wine on an organic way and biodynamic where it's not much touch in the cellar. It's uh, more part of the, our job is uh, making the, in the vineyards. Wine making has been here for centuries in my family. The conversation was always wine at the dinner table. Rebula is at the center of our wine making. It was always at the center of my grandfather. Whatever he developed, he tried to incorporate Rebula inside. Only recently it started to gain a lot in attention, also from exterior wine connoisseurs, mm -hmm. but also from media.